Is it possible to write a research proposal in just two days? Today, Jan Kirchner, researcher at OpenAI and former PhD student at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research, shares his illicit workflow. In his own words, All in all, I might be able to write one of these project proposals in two or three days, a speed up of like 10x maybe. The typical setup is a new student enters the lab and um, usually the student has some kind of idea what they want to work on. The lab has some kind of uh, open research problem that, that they're curious about. So in in the case of my PhD lab, um, that might, for example, be inhibitory neurons, like one specific type of uh, neurons in the brain um, in combination with um, plasticity and development, like early development in the brain. So like I would get some kind of, what have I searched before? I don't know, these are just uh, suggestions from the, from the side. Um, so one typical uh, question we might care about is like, uh, what type of inhibitory plasticity exists in the developing brain? So I would really just write out the question um, that contains the three terms that I'm interested in, try different permutations of that, and then uh, ask and listen for a list of, of literature. And then here in the overview, um, you can see the list of relevant papers and you get some interesting metadata here. And what I would pay attention to first is like names that are recognized here. Claudia Klopa, for example, is a famous researcher in the field. Um, Tim Fogel is also. So then I would select papers that, um, that sound somewhat familiar and then others that might be too recent or like too specific. Uh, um, so this is, I guess, for a first pass, uh, too specific, um, similar, this is probably a duplicate even. So I would select some papers that, uh, look interesting, clear on start, and then ask for more like the start papers, um, and just collect a, a, a big bunch of, of resources. And I conceptualize this first phase as an expansion phase where I just try to find as much stuff uh, as possible that out there. In this expansion phase, I don't necessarily have a super, super clear picture of the question yet. Um, ideally, the question only emerges through this process of research. Um, but what I would do is I um, pick some papers that look particularly interesting and then copy over the title into my Rome research. So this is my note-taking app where I tend to store all the information about my research and just um, copy over sufficient, a, a large enough amount of information that I can afterwards uh, identify the paper. So like uh, if I threw this back into Google, I would find the paper again. Um, let's just do this for three papers as a demonstration. And yeah, like once I've collected maybe 10 or 15 papers, I would usually focus on like review papers. I start by reading the, uh, reading the abstract, getting like a clearer idea of what it's about and then diving into the papers themselves, not necessarily reading the entire thing because oftentimes I've already read that paper in the past or I um, only care about certain subsections of the paper, um, but uh, for a first pass, this is uh, usually pretty useful. Then I tend to go here to the summarization task, um, which takes an abstract as an input and then provides uh, multiple choices for how this might be summarized. And ideally at this point, I already know what part of the article I care about. So I just tend to pick a couple of sentences that some uh, focus on the relevant portion of the article that I care about. And then I just do the same process for all the abstracts. Here we go. Yeah, please. So what is the purpose of the summarization? Is it for you so that at a later date, you can come back and uh, sort of easily explore these notes? Is it for maybe someone else so that if they're skimming through, they can sort of get an understanding at a basic level? Who is, what is the purpose of the summarization? Right. So the summarization is 
um, I guess, a mixture of both of those things. On the one hand, it's useful for me to later come back and remember what are my key takeaways from this thing. Um, mm -hmm. It's also something that I probably could just write myself, but um, these sentences, uh, these summarizations tend to be really, really to the point and like nice formulations. Um, so it's faster than me having to come up with this stuff and also just more algorithmic um, and unbiased, maybe. Like these sentences also force me to um, stick to what's actually there in the text rather than like reading what I want to read. Um, from the, from the text. Um, so that that's one advantage. And the other advantage is that I now actually already have text building blocks here. Like um, this becomes relevant in the next phase, which like let's imagine I've done this now for maybe a day and I've collected 20 of these um, and have, have some kind of idea uh, on a big picture. Now I would start um, building a draft where, where I am, I have a writing framework that I call the TSPSI framework, um, where the first is the topic. So I would specify a high level topic and here we kind of already had our high level topic in the question. So that would just be our raw thing we care about. After that, we go to the state of the art. And here, now the different um, reviews become relevant. So now I could draw the individual sentences in here and start playing around with them as building blocks to construct a scaffold of the article that's supposed to look later on. Hello, yeah. And I'm going to put this one here. And after the state of the art, we would move on to the problem with the state of the art. So this is now basically after having identified what the state of the art is, what like people know about this, we would want to come up with the next step. Um, and for that, there used to be, oh yeah, here we go. The brainstorm research questions and a lot of that section where now, oh, there's a duplicate here, it doesn't matter. So, I mean, now we have actually done uh, the reading, so it's going to be hard for us to identify a real gap in the literature, but we can come up with something just hypothesize that um, which type of interneuron mediates plasticity, make it inhibitory, plasticity and the uh, developing brain question mark. So just to be clear, this is once you've taken these summarized bullet points and you've read the articles, You've come up with sort of like a research gap or something that is a question that's unanswered in literature. And what we're putting into this, what the input of this function is, the restore root brain brainstorm research questions, is basically a play on that. It's a, a phrasing of that gap or question or new uh, frontier in which needs to be explored. Right. So now from the two articles that I've highlighted here, you can see that neither of them really mentions the development. Right. This is more like the word development just doesn't show up anywhere here. So I happen to know that the question of which type of engineer and during development is like the important one this is not really answered yet. Um, or at least it wasn't answered like a year ago when I last thought about this. Um, so then I would take that as a starting point here and we can come up with like place on sub questions for this big overarching question, because like this entire question here is going to be really hard to answer for a student in like a small project, but maybe we can figure out some sub question that is, um, more amenable to like whatever the student wants to do. Um, and the brainstorming research question is really great for that. Like it just gives me idea for uh, ideas for what to propose to the student. 
And then here at that point, I might either already have some kind of inspiration for what a solution to one of these problems could look like, or I just freeze the things here and just take this to the student in the form that it is. Um, so that was, uh, I, I noticed I got like into a kind of workflow here, which is really great about the tool. I, I, I get excited about how fast I can do things. Um, but I also noticed that maybe I've skipped about uh, a bunch of things um, that, that you might have wanted to uh, talk more about. Um, so I can stop here and then we can talk a little bit or I can move on to the second phase, which would then be the condensation phase. Uh, so I think we basically we covered everything quite well. Um, I guess one question I would have is, I think one thing that the team at least basically tries to, is very aware of, is that it's, especially when you're using Lisa to summarize or to sort of generate brainstorm research questions, they are sort of concerned about maybe, perhaps it's less relevant within um, neuroscience, but sort of bias and sort of considering how maybe through your summarization, you're missing out on things that would happen uh, if you'd actually, you know, really done it in a different way, taking the time to read the papers. Uh, I'd like you to talk about that, that a bit, because I think from what I understand, most of these papers you already encountered before, and so you understand, but it'd be, I think it'd be interesting to sort of talk about how during this expansion phase, how do you take that into consideration? Right. So yeah, you made one of the points already. Ideally, I already know these papers reasonably well um so what i'm looking here is just to retrieve information that i already have but i mean maybe i misremember the paper and maybe like i only focus on one part of the, the paper and ignore other parts of the paper that definitely is a is a danger so i would be a lot more wary if these things i'm writing down here actually went into a final paper or like went into something that's crystallized and it's going to be presented to lots and lots of people but since the setup here is more that this is an initial literature overview that I'm going to hand to a student, I kind of hope and anticipate that the student will be reading like all the background literature again, and then come back to me with and saying like, oh, but actually this paper says I'm completely different. And then we would have to go into an iteration and revise stuff. Um, but, but I agree that that is one of the major challenges when thinking about how to make stuff more scalable at like, um, the more you optimize something, the more fragile it becomes, right? Um, I think mm. Nassim Taleb, is, that's like one of his big uh, catchphrases. Um, and yeah, I, I don't want to rely on my brain to like say if something actually supports something or not. Um, it would be nice to have this in the tool. And I know that the team has been working in that direction, but I'm not completely up to date with, with what the status is on that. Thank you. I think it's a very good point in that it's very use case dependent because you're giving this to another researcher who hopefully will, you know, go back to the literature, go with, um, sort of read in depth and take this as a starting point rather than as gospel. It's a very different use case. That means that, you know, you can probably be a bit more lenient in terms of, uh, these questions, but, uh, very good answer. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's this iterative framework, which I think is also how research is done really everywhere it's never you hope that you write the total truth down in the first pass there always needs to be fallbacks and double checks of, of everything you write and um, but yes so if i just give this list to a student they will just hate me because uh, this is basically there all of the logic is basically still missing so um but and maybe it's even too much content. Like, let's imagine I put 20 papers here. Like the student is not going to want to, or be able to read that stuff. Um, but there is a difficult line to walk here where in the process of cutting down stuff, usually I get new ideas. And then instead of removing stuff, I start adding even more stuff. So that is, that is a big danger. And for that reason, I've kind of mentally separated my work progress process to two phases where I first have this expansion phase where I'm allowed to just throw everything in there and collect as much stuff as possible. But then when I approach a deadline or when I've done like half of the time that I want to work on this, I enter into the contraction phase 
where I freeze features. So I'm not allowed to add a lot of more stuff. I'm really just trying to hammer into shape whatever I have collected here. And that would basically constitute here turning this into full prose. And I faintly remember there was like an expand on this point or explain in more words. I feature at some point expand reasoning chain. Maybe. Um, so either I've been using illicit for this or uh, I fine tuned a language model on a lot of neuroscience literature and on my own personal notes. So that is also a great tool for taking individual statements and expanding them into way more text. And the same consideration that you spoke about earlier applies here. Like, how do I know that the language model is not just create complete nonsense? Um, I don't, and that's why I have to double check, right? The benefit of using a language model to expand these individual claims into paragraphs is that it just by steps, side steps, any writer's block I might have, right? I don't have to like get stuck in this phase where I stare at the page and think like, oh my God, how do I write this paragraph? I have a language model which produces a paragraph, which is going to be 50% nonsense, but then I have something to work on, right? And doing this editing process of like iteratively refining something is so much easier than to write it perfectly from scratch. Um, so I've, I've really appreciated that feature, uh, both in illicit and in like language models in general. And with that, I kind of end the arc of the uh, the contraction phase where I just try to produce nice and nice prose, or, uh, nicer and nicer prose. Um, I then, when I have the entire thing finished here in Markdown, uh, I copy everything over either into the OpenAI playground and have it formatted in LaTeX afterwards or have it formatted in any other kind of uh, thing that the student wants to see. And maybe I add some figures or illustrations if they're useful for the student. But then all in all, I might be able to write one of these project proposals in two or three days, which is super, super um, compared to like, I don't know how far, uh, how long it takes me to do this thing without assistance from tools, um, a speed up of like 10x, maybe otherwise it would take me like two or three weeks to get this done. Um, so yeah, that is like my big picture uh, workflow. I'm not quite using that exact workflow anymore because now my circumstances have changed, the type of work I do has changed, um, but I'm still super excited about sharing this with the world. Like hopefully it's useful to other people. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Jan, for uh, sharing your workflow with us today. I really recommend that everyone go to Jan's Substack and read. He's asked about his language model, Ian, because it is absolutely fascinating. Um, is there anything else you'd like to promote or talk about? Where do people find you online? Yeah, I think my Substack is still like the primary uh, point of uh, contact. So that's the universal prior .substack.com. Um, but also just feel free to shoot me an email. I think my email address is also on the Substack. Always happy to talk to people who are excited about this kind of thing. Mm -hmm.